Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. And uh, this morning we'll bring you the fourth and the last message on our series on the rapture. And I've titled this message, If You Miss the Rapture. Now my title is a little bit misleading because I do want to do a little bit more teaching on the rapture and tie it a little bit with the, uh, the tribulation. Uh, but uh, hopefully uh, we, we will also deal with the topic of if you miss the rapture. So we hopefully that uh, once we're raptured out, if anybody is tuning in uh, and you have missed the rapture and uh, millions upon millions of Christians have disappeared and you're looking YouTube and Facebook and trying to figure out what went wrong or what happened, uh, tune in. We will teach a little bit about the rapture and then we'll give you some information that will be helpful to you as you go through the tribulation. So I want to recap a little bit. During the last weeks, last three weeks, we have been preaching a series of messages regarding the rapture. Uh, today we're going to preach our last message, as I've said, and I've titled it, What If You Miss the Rapture? So I want to go over what we have learned so far. Uh, first, I made it abundantly clear that the rapture is not the second coming. Jesus never taught about the rapture. The rapture was a mystery revealed to Paul. And according to Paul, two signs must occur before the rapture. The falling away of the church and the revelation of the man of sin. We've also looked into the topic uh, of the Feast of Trumpets and how it is possible that the rupture, that the rupture, that the rapture could, have, uh, uh, could occur on the Feast of Trumpets. And we have explained why we cannot hold this position with certainty. Now, we, we're inclined to uh, say that this is a possibility, but I've explained why you cannot uh, pound your hand on the pulpit and say, the rapture is going to happen on the Feast of Trumpets. Um, and we've also taught you that the Antichrist is revealed in three phases. He first appears as the man of sin. Then he appears as the son of perdition who betrays the nation of Israel. And thirdly, he appears as that wicked one fully indwelt with the power of Satan, uh, bent on killing all the saints of God in this world. The Antichrist, we also mentioned clearly that the uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 teaches that the Antichrist cannot be revealed in his time, and we made it clear what that his time means, until the church and the Holy Spirit are taken away first. So now let's pray. Uh, sorry, before we pray, let's turn to our text. I want to read you our text this morning, and we're going to uh, read a lot. We're going to read the entire book of Revelation this morning, so but no, I'm just kidding. I was going to say, get out your popcorn, but I shouldn't be saying that. So turn with me to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, and I want you to see this with your own eyes. So if you don't have a Bible, go grab your Bible and open it up, and I want you to read along with me. So I'm going to give you a few, a few moments. I'll pretend I'm going to go get my Bible over here, so it'll give you some time to get your Bible, and hopefully you'll come back with your Bible. And I really want you to see what I'm about to read to you with your own eyes. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat on the throne to look upon was like jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So now jump with me to Revelation chapter 5, and I will read the entire chapter of, 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 of chapter 5, because I... I was trying to read a few verses here and there, but it's a very short chapter. And so here we have John hear a voice and saying, come up hither. And John goes to heaven and the angel tells him, you're going to see things that are going to happen after this. Keep that in mind. So Revelation chapter 5 verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and with, on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, 
neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now we know what these seven seals are. They're all associated with the period of tribulation. So here's John in heaven, and uh, he's already in heaven. John is already in heaven, and he sees this book. And John is crying and weeping because no one is worthy to open this book. And the angel says, don't worry, John. The lion of the tribe of Judah, he will open the book. Verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon a throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. So these elders are an interesting bunch of characters. They're wearing white raiment. They have crowns on the head. And they're holding vials, which are the prayers of the saints. And they, now these elders, sing a song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So these elders are identifying themselves. They're giving us their identity. They are looking at this lamb who goes before the God, before God who is on a throne, and he takes the book from God. And these elders are saying to this lamb, you, have, you were slain and you redeemed us to God by your blood and were out of every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And verse 10, and has made us, these elders are saying to this lamb, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, which... And such are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And I also want to read two verses in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And after all this is happening, verse six, uh, chapter 6, verse 1 says, And I saw the Lamb, and he opened one of the seals. And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And him that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this time, this message. We pray, Lord God, it be a blessing to your people. And Father, we have a lot of ground to cover, Lord, this morning. I pray you give your people patience and attention and wisdom, Lord God, and understanding. And I pray that the Holy Spirit may illumine them, Lord God, as we deal with some material that may not be common knowledge to most, Lord God. But I pray, Father, that you bless this message and you bless your word, Lord God, as we are doing all this for your honor and for your glory and for your might and for your majesty. Thy kingdom come, O Lord, thy will be done on earth. I pray, Lord God, your will be done in the hearts of these people this morning and that you may be glorified and magnified in their sight. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Today, there's a lot of prophecy teachers who teach one thing, and there are other prophecy teachers who teach another. And the truth is, there's a little bit of confusion among the children of God and the people of God as to what to believe, as to what is right. And that was the purpose of the series that I presented you in the last few weeks, and we will be concluding it this morning, to help you navigate through all these so-called teachings and uh, the opinion of this guy and the, and the opinion of that guy. And what I have attempted to do, to do through the power of God is present to you what I believe the Bible teaches regarding the end times. <coughs> now, I make no apology for what I'm about to say. The Bible clearly teaches a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. This is not my opinion. This is from the Bible. And hopefully my, my whole purpose so far is to present you the Word of God in such a way so you can see it also. 
And I'm going to say this, and it may offend some of you listening to me this morning or some of you who will listen later on, that anyone who teaches otherwise is leading you astray. And I can say that with confidence. And I can also say they have a false understanding of eschatology. Now, I'm not saying they are wrong in all points regarding their teaching on eschatology, but they are wrong when they teach anything but a pre-tribulation rapture. At this point, you may say, and you may, and you have the right to say it. How do you know? You may be pointing the finger at me, and you may say, "How do you know that you're right?" And my answer is, the Bible clearly teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. And the reason why these people teach something different is because they err, not knowing how to divide the word of truth. In Second Timothy chapter two fifteen. The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And this is why, my friends, I am an unapologetic dispensationalist. If you understand dispensations, then you'll understand that the church must leave before the tribulation occurs. Sorry. And I will prove it to you this morning once again as we go through this passage that we read to you this morning in the book of Revelation. During our study through the book of Revelation, we would spend three lessons studying the rapture. Lessons 11, 12, and 13. And I believe these lessons are online. You can look them up on Facebook and watch them at your leisure. We're not going to regurgitate the material that we spent covering them. During that time, we, we uh, explained to you the different rapture theories, and we also explained to you why we believe the Bible teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. And at the end of Lesson 12, I gave you a list of 24 reasons for a pre-tribulation rapture. And not only one, but 24 reasons. One of the tools that the Holy Spirit has given you and I regarding in correctly interpreting Scripture is biblical typology. Sure. Biblical typology. Typology is... Typology is a method of biblical interpretation whereby an element or event found in the Old Testament is seen to prefigure one found in the New Testament. I'm going to read this definition again, a very important theological definition, and you'll find it throughout the scriptures. Topology is a method of biblical interpretation whereby an element or event found in the Old Testament is seen to prefigure one found in the New Testament. Many events described in the Old Testament were shaped by God to provide types foreshadowing Christ. We have Isaac, Adam, David, Solomon, Abraham, the type of the Father, Isaac, type of Christ, his servant, Eliezer, a type of the Holy Spirit. And this typology is not only restricted to the Old Testament, but it also finds its way in the New Testament. We mentioned in last week's message, how the feasts of the Lord foreshadowed future events in the life of ministry, ministry of Christ. We also told you that Paul himself testifies of this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But this body is of Christ. One of the greatest events in our history, the week of creation, foreshadows the fact that God has appointed 7,000 years or 7 millennia to human history. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Now the context of Peter chapter 3 is the second coming of the Lord. And Peter was answering those who were saying, where is the promise of the Lord's coming? In the book of Revelation, we are told that the millennial kingdom, the millennial reign of Christ, lasts for how many years? 1,000 years, clearly. Black and white, no interpretation required. Even a child can see that. And it's referred to as the rest in the Bible. Some may counter and say, well, it's already 2021, and if God was correct, if this type of biblical interpretation was correct, then the Lord hasn't come back yet. It's 2021. And the problem, my friend, is they started counting from the wrong time. Yeah. They started counting with the birth of Christ. 
We know from the book of Daniel that the 69th week or the 69th week of punishment upon Israel ends with the crucifixion of Christ. So the book of Daniel tells us it ends with the crucifixion of Christ. And then what do you think we should count from that point on? So we, we do not need to count from Christ's birth, but from his death. Now here I have a, a simple timeline that I'm going to come closer to show you. Uh, God does things in threes and seven. How many days of creation are we told is in the book of Genesis? Seven days of creation. Each day corresponds to a millennia in the history of earth. So here I'm going to put this chart up for you to see. And you will see that the God has appointed seven years or seven or seven seven days, I'm sorry, which correspond to 7,000 years. From year zero to 4,000, what happens after the 4,000th year? Christ comes on the scene. Then after Christ, we have two more days. And then the third day is called the day of rest in the Bible. The Bible calls these first four days the former days. The day five and six, they're called the last days. And the seventh day is called the day of rest. Where do we find all this? In the Bible. In the Bible. So to believe anything other than this is to throw away the great typology that God has given us in the week of creation. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, the Bible says, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. And Paul makes the case in the book of Hebrew is that there are, is a rest for God's people. We know this rest is in the millennial kingdom of Christ. Based on this information, we can be pretty confident that Christ's second coming will co coincide with the ending of the sixth millennium, which is quickly approaching on our calendar. That's if our calendar is right. And when would you think the, the end of the sixth millennium would occur? If our calendar is right. And if we started counting from the right place. It would coincide, I believe, with 2033. Because that would be two days after the crucifixion of Christ. Now, I want to bring you to a clear prophecy in the Word of God that further solidifies the belief that Christ will come back at the end of this millennium. So according to what we should be counting, we should be 1990 something right now, if we were to count from the death of Christ. Now I want you to turn with me to Hosea chapter 5. One of the main themes of the minor prophets is the second coming of Christ. There's more written about the second coming of Christ than his first coming. In fact, we have more material on the second coming of Christ than the New Testament church itself. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel, uh, Joel, Hosea, Amos, Abadiah. Abadiah deals with the uh, end of Edom. But all these minor prophets, their main theme is the second coming of Christ. So I want you to turn with me to Hosea chapter 5. And I want you to see it with your own eyes. And I pray that the Holy Spirit illumine your understanding as we read these verses. You will see both the ascension of Christ and his return in this passage. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 15. And this is the Spirit of the Lord speaking. And he says through the prophet, I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction they will seek me early and continue in chapter 6 with me verse 1 come and let us return unto the lord for he hath torn and he will heal us he hath smitten he will bind us up do not miss the next two verses Hosea chapter 6 verse 2 and after two days After two days, after two days, he will revive us. What is the promise of God to the children of Israel? That one day, what? 
All Israel shall be saved, and God shall pour his spirit upon the nation of Israel, and they will turn to God. After two days he will revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow the one to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. Now, in Hosea chapter 5, verse 15, God says, I will go to my place. I will go to my place, and I will only come back when they acknowledge me. And Hosea chapter 6 tells us, after two days, he will revive us. And in the third day, we shall live in his sight. Do you not see this? Do you not see this cluster? crystal clear prophecy in the book of Hosea. Matthew 23, 39 says, For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's going to be the cry of the Jewish people at the end of the tribulation. When they're afflicted, they will turn to God. And the book of Zechariah tells us they will look upon him as one who is pierced, as one mourns for his son. They will mourn over the Christ. In James chapter 5, when we studied the book of James on Wednesday nights, we made it clear that the, uh, the, the second coming of Christ is associated with what? With rains, with the latter rain. And we spent a whole lesson talking about that. And what are we told here in Hosea? We're told that he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. We, James tells us that the second coming of Christ is associated with the coming of the latter rain. James chapter 5. There's more than enough proof from the scripture that we don't have much time left. Right. The rapture is around the corner and make sure that you have received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior because if you haven't, you will miss the rapture. I have taught you through the scriptures what must happen before the rapture occurs and I make no apology with what I'm teaching because I find in the word of God black and white. And that's why I do not apologize for teaching the Word of God, even if it may go against your ideology or something that you've been, you've been erroneously taught as a child or even in Bible school. And I'm telling you, based on biblical typology and prophecy, we don't have more than five years left if our calendar is right. You may get offended at me at this, but that's, that's, that's up to you. If this upsets you, then you need to spend more time in the Bible. Time in the scripture will allow the Holy Spirit to illumine your understanding. You will reject what I'm telling you if you are simply a casual visitor of the Bible. That's right. I'm not going to lose my reward and I'm not going to tell you how many times I've read through the Bible. How many times I've spent studying the prophecies and scriptures. I'm not going to do that. But let's just say uh, some of you have uh, read it more times than your age. In Luke chapter 2, verse 25 and 26, it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. He himself even prophesied to Mary that her son would die. It would pierce her soul, Luke 2, 35. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. How did Simeon know that Christ was coming? The Pharisees missed it. The Sadducees missed it. The scribes missed it. The lawyers missed it. But one man knew that Christ was coming. He knew that Christ was to be born. And he knew that he wouldn't die until Christ was born. Who revealed it to him? The Holy Spirit. He was devout. That means he prayed, he read, he fasted, he served God. Do you know that the prophet Daniel told the Jewish people when Christ would be crucified? He told them. In Daniel chapter 9, 25 and 26. Let me read it to you. You can turn there if you want. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. 
and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and with the end of war, desolations are determined. Anyone who understood the prophecy of Daniel could have calculated the time of Christ's death. <coughs> they would have known that Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah the promise or the decree to rebuild Jerusalem in troublous times. 483 prophetic years from the time that Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah permission to build Jerusalem, Christ would be crucified. But they couldn't see it, they couldn't understand it. Why? Because they didn't spend enough time in the scriptures. Simeon did. Simeon knew that Christ was going to come. Right. Why? Because um, he was devout, the Bible says. The scribes and the Pharisees and all the educated men and the Bible scholars and the Bible the know-it-alls, they didn't know. They didn't know. Have you seen what has happened the last year and a half? Every country has or is in the process of requiring COVID passports. No passport, no travel. No passport, no job. No passport, no venues. No passport, no health care. No passport, no education. No passport, no more loans from the banks and financial institutions. It's coming. God has allowed this to happen in our lifetimes so that the people may see what is awaiting them. Now, I'm not saying the vaccine is the mark of the beast, but this whole COVID thing is so that people can see what will happen when the Antichrist comes on the earth and how the mark of the beast is going to be instituted Globally, yeah. if you cannot see this, I pray that the Holy Spirit will show it to you. To me, it's as clear as daylight. It's as clear as daylight. Yeah. This COVID thing is a type of the mark of the beast. And if you can't see it, I pray the Holy Spirit show it to you. I pray the Holy Spirit show it to you. Now, I'm not saying it's the vaccine is the mark of the beast. The vaccine is a whole issue altogether. You want to take it, go ahead and take it. Knock yourself out. But I myself don't want to take it. I want the freedom not to take it, just as I want you to have the freedom to take it if you want to. None, none of this mandate stuff. Obesity is a problem in America. Do we mandate that everybody stop eating hot dogs and chips and drinking Coke? We should mandate that. It's for their own good. It's for their own health. If you want to eat chips and gorge yourself on uh, pizza and, and uh, cheesecake and die diabetes, it's your choice. You have free will. Sure. What I'm saying is not much time left. You better get saved because the rapture is around the corner. If the Lord doesn't take me home some other way, I firmly believe with all my heart that I will be raptured during my lifetime. And I do not apologize for telling you this if this offends you. Based on my study of the scriptures, God has set a perfect type of the history he has given on earth. Christ came at the end of 4,000 years. In the fullness of times, God says, Christ sent his son. And it wasn't a mystery. It wasn't an accident. We know from the prophet Daniel when Christ was getting crucified. So you can say, well, based on the lifetime of a man, now you can argue the fact that we did not know at what age Christ should have been crucified. But you would have known when he would have been crucified and you could have back calculated. And you could, oh, I know Christ is coming back any time because I know when, he was going to be, when he's going to be crucified. But they were blind to the scriptures. Well, how, what was one of the things that Christ accused his own disciples of? No. Do you not understand? Do ye not yet understand? Do ye have not faith? That was one of the accusations toward his own disciples. And in fact, study Luke chapter 24. They even denied his resurrection. They didn't believe it happened. After he told them over and over again that he was going to rise from the dead. And when it happened, they didn't believe it. Study Luke chapter 24. And in the book of Revelation, God has neatly laid out for us what will occur before the Antichrist is revealed in his time. What happened after John finished writing his letter to the seven churches? God calls them to heaven. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. And after this I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me. And what did the trumpet say? Come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be 
hereafter. John, first you must come to heaven. And after you come to heaven, John, I'm going to show you the things that are going to happen after you come to heaven. And John's ascent to heaven is a type of the Spirit and the rapture. John's ascent to heaven in the Spirit is a type of the rapture of the church. And soon he will be shown what will happen afterwards. No theologian denies that John the Apostle is a type of the Bride of Christ. No theologian can deny that. There's enough evidence in the Scripture that points that John the Apostle is a type of the Bride of Christ. Yeah. Of all the Apostles, who sat next to the bosom of Christ? John did. Of all the Apostles, who has it said that Jesus loved? John. When Christ told them that one of you will betray me, all of them said, is it I? Only one said, who is it, Lord? John. John the Apostle is a type of the Bride of Christ. His Gospel is different. His epistles are different. So if John is a type of the church, and John has just finished writing the letters to the seven churches, which describe the history of the church, after the church age, the rapture happens. The church age closes with the rapture of the church. And John gets raptured out and Christ says, John, now that you're here in heaven, I'm going to show you the things that are going to happen after you have come to heaven. And Revelation chapters 4 and 5 teach a gap between the rapture and the church, uh, a gap between the rapture of the church and the time of the Antichrist. Remember the phases of the Antichrist revelation. So now we're starting to tie some things in here. Paul gives us the signs before the rapture. So after the rapture happens, Revelation 4 and 5 are a gap. Some things must happen in heaven before the tribulation can start. John is already in heaven. He's a type of the church. So what has to happen? We have to have our crowns. Why? Because the elders represent the church. And we have to cast our feet before Christ and proclaim that he alone is worthy before he actually opens the first seal. So the church must be in heaven to do all this stuff. That tells me that the judgment seat of Christ occurs during this gap. We receive our crowns. We've taught you on the crowns, and especially in the book of James, we spent some time in other lessons teaching about the crowns. That's why it's important that you attend Wednesday night and Sunday mornings. We teach all this stuff during that time. Sorry. So we receive our crowns, we cast them before the feet of Christ, and we proclaim, we tell him, the church tells Christ, you alone are worthy to open the book and to open the seals. Christ cannot open the seals until the church tells him he is worthy to open the seals. See how clear it is in the book of Revelation? Have I taught you Matthew chapter 24? I have avoided Matthew chapter 24. But when we're going to talk about the tribulation in a moment, we're going to get into Matthew chapter 24. The elders in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 represent the church. They were clothed in white raiment and had crowns on their head. And they sing a song, Revelation 5 and 9 and 10. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. These are the saints, my friends. This is language of New Testament born-again believers. Colossians 1.14 says, and we have, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In 1 Peter 2.9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Revelation 1 6, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Christ will only open the seven sealed book after the church has said, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. That's why the church must be in heaven before the tribulation. Yeah. Because the tribulation does not start until we tell Christ. Am I being clear? Is the Bible clear? Until we tell Christ, you are worthy to open the seals. In verse 1 of chapter 6, what happens? The Lamb opens the first seal. <clears throat> Do you see how the book of Revelation 
neatly lays out the timeline of the church age, the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ, and the beginning of the tribulation. That's why it's so important that you know your Bible. It's so important that you understand typology. Because you may read Revelation 4, 5, and 6 and have no idea what it's talking about. Another important doctrine to consider is Daniel's 70th week. I'm going to spend a few minutes on that. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, Daniel says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Now, who are Daniel's people? Israel. The Jews, Israel. And upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the holy one. To anoint the most holy. Who is this most holy? That's going to be anointed. That's Christ. Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy is one of the most significant and detailed messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. The chapter begins with Daniel praying for Israel, acknowledging and confessing the sin of his people and asking for God's mercy. And as Daniel was praying, the angel Gabriel comes and he tells Daniel, Daniel, I'm going to interpret the vision for you. All Bible students agree that the seven sevens, the seventy sevens, should be understood as seventy weeks of years. In other words, a period of four hundred ninety days. Four hundred ninety years. I'm sorry. During that four hundred ninety years, they represent landmarks in the history of Israel. At the beginning of that four hundred ninety years, is a decree to rebuild Jerusalem and the wall. The completion would occur 49 years after, seven weeks. And after that, 434 years later, the Messiah would be cut off. And at the end of the 70th week, the Messiah would be anointed. So in Daniel's 70 weeks, we have a first coming of the crucifixion of Christ and the second coming of Christ. Do you see how Daniel tells us that the, the end is the, crucifix, the crucifixion of Christ? So that's where we have to start counting, from the crucifixion of Christ. And then Daniel tells us, in the last week, he will be anointed. And he also tells us that during the half of this last week, the Antichrist would break his covenant and the end of it all, and he would anoint, and the, the, he would break the covenant, and at the end of the seven years, Messiah would be anointed king. So here's another chart I want to share with you. And we have this all in the series of the book of Revelation that we did. Another chart, another timeline. Now what you have is a lot of this, this is a little busy. So before the tribulation can begin, this chart does not show it, but the rapture of the church must happen. Because this last week, God again deals with his people Israel. He does not deal with the church. This whole entire week is the week that is left for Israel to finish their transgression, to finish their iniquity. God punished Israel 490 years because after the captivity, they, when they, they did not go back into the land and they did not fully follow God. So God says, because you have not obeyed me, because you have not repented during your captivity, I'm going to punish you seven times more. How long was the captivity? It was 70 years according to the prophet Jeremiah. So 70 years times 7 is 490 years. In fact, God sent them prophets. Ezekiel, he pleaded with them. But what is the, lament, the lamentation in the prophet Ezekiel? The children of Israel did not return to God during their captivity. So God says, I'm going to punish you seven, seven times more. So in addition to a 70-year captivity, God was going to punish Israel 490 years. And we are told by the prophet Daniel, the 483rd year would end with the crucifixion of the Messiah. How many years are left? Seven years or one week. And this last week we call the period of the tribulation. The church will be raptured. We will be judged. We will receive crowns. We will throw crowns at the feet of Christ. We will say to Christ, thou art worthy. And when we tell him, that he is worthy to open the book, he will indeed open the book, and that begins the tribulation. And Daniel tells us in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist will break the covenant. He will set up a, the abomination of de desolation in the temple that will be soon rebuilt, and he will proclaim himself to be God. And the Jews realize at that point that he is a false messiah, a false king, and they will rebel against him, and he will pursue, he will prosecute them. And great turmoil is going to be on the earth, even greater turmoil. 
then the end of the tribulation will end with the wrath of God and the second coming of Christ. And after that, Christ will be anointed and he will usher in the millennial kingdom. Now, I've, 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 I've said a lot of things to you. Uh, a lot of, I've thrown a lot of information to you. I've done that because we don't have a lot of time left. And I can only cover so much material in one hour. And I want to show you another timeline uh, of the tribulation. And in this timeline, I'm going to keep it on here for a for a few uh, for a few seconds, and all this is in the Book of Revelation uh, study that we did, and I have all the verses here in this in this timeline. So I'm gonna keep it there for a few seconds. So if you're watching this video at a later time, you can always still pause the video and take a screenshot of this and look at the references that I've given on this timeline. There's a gap between the rapture of the church and the tribulation. How do we know that? The Book of Revelation teaches us. There are two signs that have to happen before the rapture. How do we know that? Paul teaches us. How do we know the tribulation of seven years? Daniel tells us. How do we know the second coming of Christ is going to come after the tribulation? Christ tells us. And so does Daniel. You see how you have to take all these individual prophecies in Scripture and through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the illumination of the Holy Spirit, you can tie it all together? You must, you must read your Bibles. You can't just simply watch your favorite YouTube pre preacher. You must read and study your Bibles. The everlasting righteousness that Daniel speaks about in the verses that we just read deals with the millennial reign of the Lord during the day of rest. During the day of rest. If you understand all that I've taught you so far, and you may have to go back and re-listen to this video, then you will know that during the tribulation, God once again deals with the Jews. God has done with the church. The tribulation is a different dispensation. So soteriolo so, soteriologically, it cannot be that the church goes into the tribulation. Different requirements. And as we have previously taught in last week's lesson, according to Paul, the church and the Holy Spirit must be removed before the Antichrist can do his thing. And I want to reiterate this point. The most of what I've taught you concerning the rapture comes from the Pauline epistles, and today also from the book of Revelation. The second epistle to the Thessalonians, as we have said, was written by call to calm and to assure them that they did not miss the rapture. I have not taught any doctrine regarding the rapture by running to Matthew chapter 24. And I've warned you before and I tell you, if you have somebody who's teaching the rapture and he goes to Matthew chapter 24, take, it, take what he says with a grain of salt. He's going to confuse you, guaranteed. If you listen to anybody who teaches the rapture in Matthew chapter 24, you will be confused. I don't know how else to tell you. And if you're one of those preachers that teaches the rapture in Matthew chapter 24, you do not know the scriptures. You do err not knowing the truth. You do not rightly divide the word of truth according to 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. Right? Did I get the reference right? 2 Timothy 2.15. So, if you miss the rapture, you'll be months away, perhaps a few years, from the tribulation. We don't know how long this gap is. The Bible doesn't tell us. But knowing from typology, the gap cannot be too long. Because God starts the next dispensation soon after the first one finishes. You will experience emotional devastation. You will suddenly and irretrievably lose a spouse, a child, a parent, a friend, a colleague, a neighbor, or perhaps another loved one. There will be no long illness during which you can be prepared for this, no dead bodies to identify, no human way of finding closure. Countless fair-weather Christians, those who have long described themselves as Christians, will experience horror when they realize that they were not included in the rapture. Now, I'm not trying to teach you out of your salvation. That's what I'm doing. I hate that. I hate preachers that do that. But there's a lot of profession Christians out there. Oh, yeah, I've trusted Christ. You know you're going to heaven? Well, I hope so. Then how do you call yourself a Christian? They will feel sick when they realize that despite having gone to church and perhaps having occasionally read the Bible and done good works and perhaps been religious in, in some way, that they never really understood or accepted God's simple gift of salvation. Imagine the economic implications of the rapture as the world deals with all the accidents and incidents as a result of countless 
having disappeared while they were driving a car, flying a plane, driving a bus, operating a crane or some other piece of equipment? <coughs> How will the elites and the political pawns explain this phenomenon of hundreds of millions of people disappearing from the earth at the same time? How will they explain it? How will the world replace all those Christians in key positions? Especially here in our country, in America, we have a lot of, we have some politicians who, are, who I believe are Christians. They're not sold out Christians, but they're Christians nonetheless. The hordes of hell will try to convince you of the coming lies. The followers of the New Age cult tell us, they teach that there's a coming apocalypse that will cleanse the earth of all those who are in need of purgation. These blots on the biosphere are typically described as those less evolved, souls who, will, who do not see the all-in-one or that God is all, or all is God. <coughs> at, the, at that time, perhaps you'll be confused. You won't know what to believe. But you can find comfort that Christ predicted these things would occur. And during the tribulation, where are you going to turn to? The Pauline epistles? What portion of scripture are you going to turn to to find out what's going on in your lifetime? Matthew, Matthew chapter 24. And Jesus answers and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Verse 5. For many shall come into my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. That's what you're going to be reading in the tribulation. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted. Remember what we talked about Hosea? He was talking about the affliction of the Jews. And then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So who is Christ talking to here? The Jews, once again, God deals with the Jews. And then that shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. 66% chance of dying in the tribulation. And you want to go through it? And if you make it alive, if you endure until the end, you will be saved. In other words, your life will be spared. 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let him which is in Judea flee into the mountains. We're talking about another holocaust in Israel. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of the house. That's what they will be reading, Matthew 24, not us. Now, when we read Matthew 24 and we see all these signs, we say, oh, wow, these signs coincide with Matthew 24. That means the second coming of Christ is near. So if the second coming of Christ is near, the rapture is much more near. You see how that works? I don't teach Matthew 24 to tell you that the rapture is in there. I teach Matthew 24 telling you these are the signs of the second coming, not the rapture. These are the signs of the second coming, not the rapture. And some of these signs, we're seeing them now. So when I see the signs of the second coming, what does that tell me? That the rapture is also near. Because we know it happens before the tribulation. Verse 18, Either let him which is in the field turn back to take his clothes, and woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. The Jews will, will hightail it out of Israel after this Antichrist character shows up on the scene. And after he proclaims himself as God, the Bible says he's going to make wage war on the saints. For then shall great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened. The second chart I showed you back tells you there's a gap between the end of the tribulation and the second coming of Christ. Christ tells us he's going to come before the seven years are up. We don't know when. We don't know the day or the hour. You see how that fits in? And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, he is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall rise false Christ, false prophets, and shall show signs and wonders, and so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. 
You notice that when we teach the tribulation, we go to Matthew chapter 24. Because that's what it's about. Yeah. The signs in the tribulation. That's right. God will not leave those who miss the rapture without hope, for He will send 144,000 Jewish evangelists preaching the gospel of the kingdom. They will be anointed at the beginning of the tribulation. Where are they now? What will they be preaching? They will be preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And God will also send Moses and Elijah to Israel to antagonize the Antichrist. He will also send an angel who will fly around telling people to believe the gospel of the kingdom. Now what does Paul tell us in Galatians about an angel preaching the gospel? Cursed be that angel who preaches the gospel. But in, Re in the tribulation, different dispensation. 11, 14, uh, Revelation 14, 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Does an angel preach to us in the dispensation of grace? Absolutely not. Do you see how the entire tribulation is a different dispensation? They're going to even have an angel preaching to them from heaven. Saying with a loud voice, this is what the angel is going to preach. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth, and the sea and the fountains of the water. So if you miss the rapture, you need to remember that the tribulation is seven years, and the clock starts ticking when the Antichrist signs, the covenant of death, the agreement with hell, Isaiah chapter 28, verse 18. At some point, the Bible tells us the, the Antichrist will institute a mark that you will have to decide whether you take or not. You're also told that those days will be shortened, Matthew 24, 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. 66% chance of dying in the tribulation. The Bible tells us that the men in the tribulation will be as rare as the gold of Ophir. When you think you're going to make it through the tribulation, so God will shorten the days, but never tells us for how long. Therefore, no one knows the day or the hour that Christ is coming back. Do you see how that fits in? Yeah. The day or the hour has nothing to do with the rapture, my friends. I heard it so many times as a kid, it didn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense. Because I read Matthew 24 and said, He's telling us that you're going to see the abomination of desolation. And we know it's going to be three and a half years. But then the days are going to be shortened. We don't know by how long. Oh, that's why he tells us no one knows the day or the hour. Because no one knows how much shorter God will make the second half of the tribulation. And I want to close with the following. If you don't believe we're near the end, I want to give you some signs that are actually occurring. On May 14, 1948, Israel gained its independence. In June of 1967, Israel defeated the Arab armies and conquered, retook Jerusalem. On May 14, 2018, the United States Embassy officially was relocated to Jerusalem on the 70th anniversary of the Israeli Declaration of Independence. Through animal breeding, the Jews are now raising the red heifer that they need to, for the purification of the Levites and themselves, the specified man, uh, numbers 19. The, ter the third temple has already been designed. The priests have been trained. The menorah has been built. And in 2017, for the first time in nearly 2,000 years, a sheep was sacrificed near the Temple Mount. The Trump administration has drawn up a map on the creation of a future Palestinian state connecting the West Bank and Gaza. In 2020, the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, and this is important because they're going to do something else in this country soon. In 2020, the United Arab Emirates and Israel normalized relations. The president of Turkey wants to re-establish the caliphate and Turkey is aiming at joining the EU in 2023. The elites want to implant an FRID, an FRID chip in every RFID chip in every human by 2025. That's the plan, the goal. And this COVID thing, they already planned it out 10 years ago. The documents are out there, the evidence is out there, everything is out there for you to find. Search the truth and you will find it. God will lead you to the truth. They planned this COVID, this COVID pandemic 10 years ago. Yep. And they're planning an RFID chip to be injected in every person by 2025. The Vatican is actively working on, our, on, our, on uniting all the religions. Right now in Abu Dhabi, they are building the Abrahamic family house. It will be a collection of three religious spaces, a mosque, a synagogue, and a church. And guess what kind of church? A Baptist church. No. You have one guess. 
a Catholic church. And all of these three buildings will sit on a pavilion where secular visitors can come and this pavilion is going to encourage everyone to exemplify human fraternity and solidarity within a community that cherishes the values of mutual respect and peaceful coexistence while the unique character of each faith is preserved. It is scheduled, be, it's scheduled to be opened in 2022. Do you think that's going to be the venue through which the Antichrist will reveal himself on the earth? Say, here am I. I'm going to solve all your problems. We all believe in the same God. Different paths lead to God. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the door and the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We are being told that human civilization may not be able to survive if we do not manage to create a global government. What more proof do you need? Right. What more proof do you need? I talk to Christians, oh, we don't know when Christ is going to come back. It may be 50 years, it may be 100 years, it may be 300 years. Then you don't know your Bible, I'm sorry. I hate to tell it to you, but you don't know the scriptures. You're an infant, you're a babe in Christ. How many times have you read through your Bible? Let me put it bluntly. Once? Twice? 20? 10? 30? 40? Then come talk to me. So in summary, if you miss the rapture, don't believe what the alphabet soup networks will tell you as to why more than half, perhaps more, a billion people disappeared. The aliens did not take us. They did not abduct us. We're not in some UFO being experimented on, being prodded and poked. The Lord Jesus came and took us, just as he promised. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and, your, and live your life according to the commandments of God. That's what Revelation tells you. Do not take the mark of the beast. Refuse all and any injections of an RFID or similar microchip. Do not worship or bow down to the image of the beast which will be set up in the third temple that will, that will be built in Jerusalem after the signing of the new land for peace deal that the Antichrist will forge between the Jews and the Arabs. Get as far away as you can from the Middle East. God, Christ tells you, when you see the abomination of, de of desolation, flee! There will be millions of vacant homes in the United States. Mine will be one of them. As you're able to come and squat in, we'll have plenty of, of protection and plenty of food for you. If you live on an island, leave for the mainland. The meteorites that will hit the earth will create incredible tsunamis. God will shake the earth and all the islands, he says, will be removed. So I would not be one of I would not be I would not want to live on an island during the tribulation. <clears throat> if you live in the tropics or subtropics, head for much colder weather. Go to Canada. For the sun will burn you alive. Revelation 69. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God. And this is the, this is the sad part. Which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. Make sure you have enough food and water for at least six years. Because I don't think I don't believe the mark of the beast is going to institute it right away. Uh, there's going to be a, a time period from when the Antichrist uh, tells everybody you must take the mark. till everybody has to take the mark. Make sure you can protect all your resources. Yeah. If any Jew seeks refuge in your home, let him in, or you will be judged for refusing them hospitality, and you will certainly be cast into hell. If you get caught or arrested for refusing the mark, or refusing to bow down to the image, make it clear that you will not take the mark or bow down the image, no matter what. You will understand that you will be beheaded for your stance. Accept your fate, for heaven awaits you. Revelation 19.20 says, And the beast was taken, and him with the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, that which he deceived them that had the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with the brimstone. And I want to end with Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So there's hope. If you miss the rapture, trust in Christ. The Holy Spirit will be gone. There will be no new birth. But you have to maintain that trust and faith in Christ until the very end. And do not take the mark. Do not worship the image. And you will join us in heaven if you do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this time. My hope and prayer, Lord God, was through this series that I was crystal clear 
crystal, crystal clear that there will be no ambiguity to anybody who listens to this message as to what your work teaches. Father, I do not say these things based on my knowledge or my study of the Scriptures, but I say them based on the authority of the Word of God, that you have made it so clear, so crystal clear, as to what will happen, as to when will it happen, as to how it will happen. And we cannot go around with our heads in the sand saying, we don't know, we don't know. The reason why you don't know is because you do not read the Word of God as He tells you to. Study the Scripture to, sh to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the Word of Truth is what you tell us, Lord God. You tell us to study the Word, to study, to study, to study. I pray, God, these messages have been a blessing to your people. And I pray, Lord God, that any confusion or any ambiguity that may have existed in our minds or hearts may be dispelled through the series of these messages that you allowed us to preach, Lord God. May you take your word and richly bless it into the hearts of your people. And I pray that the Holy Spirit may illumine anyone who has been listening to the series, that they may see the truth as it is written in the pages of the Holy Book of God, black and white. And may the Holy Spirit interpret these things in the hearts of the listeners. And may you encourage them. May they know that they will not go through the tribulation, that you will take them out before you pour your wrath upon the earth, because you will once again deal with your people. You must finish the transgression. The iniquity must be paid for. The 490 years must come to an end. But in your mercy you will cut them short. Just like in a wilderness, you told them they would wander the wilderness for 40 years, but you graced them with two years. You cut it short because of your mercy and because of your grace. We thank you, God, for your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.